you can see what's behind me. When COVID hit in March, my wife and I were in the Philippines. They're teaching uh, at one of the great Bible institutes there. And we're preparing for a weekend to minister there in many of the churches there in Manila. When suddenly I got the news from the president of the Bible Institute and he said, Pat, you're gonna have to finish your uh, class one week early. And then we're gonna have to get you into Manila tonight as soon as you're done because the city is going into lockdown Saturday. No one's going in or going out. You're going to have to find a way to get home out of Manila. And, you know, I had, most of us have never been in that kind of situation before. I didn't even know what a lockdown was, uh, but I knew I needed to find a flight and somehow get out of the country. And, you know, Manila airport is chaotic just on regular days, you know, so you can imagine how chaotic it was during the COVID pandemic. And man, um, I remember standing in those long crowded lines waiting to adjust my flights and get a flight out. And I began conversing with the guy in front of me. He was somewhere from Europe and we began talking and uh, you could see the tension uh, and the anxiety on everyone there in the airport. And you know, when we finally got to the ticket booth, he went his way and I was going my way. And before he departed, he looked at me and he said, man, it's the end of the world, you know? And I wish uh, we had gotten to that conversation earlier. And because, you know, everyone has that sense with what is going on, not only with the COVID crisis, but the election chaos, the economic turmoil, crisis in the Middle East and around the world, that we're headed towards some kind of apocalyptic end. <laughs> so we're gonna be talking about the COVID crisis and the coming plagues. And I wanna recommend a great book to you here by our friend, Dr. Mark Hitchcock there on the Corona crisis, plagues, pandemics, and the coming apocalypse, right? I'll, I'll refer to this book throughout my presentation, um, get a lot of good information from here. So I recommend if you wanna do further study on this area, uh, go check out that book. And also go to our website there at evidenceandanswers.org. You can listen to my interview with great scholars like Mark Hitchcock, and you'll be able to hear re-airings of this seminar there on our website there at evidenceandanswers.org. But there is a sense that we're headed for some kind of an apocalyptic cataclysmic end here. You see in Hollywood, there are all kinds of movies that have come out depicting some kind of catastrophic end of the world. And whether people say it verbally or not, there's a sense that we're headed towards some kind of an apocalyptic end. You know what's interesting, in a lot of the world religions, there's also some kind of an apocalyptic end. And of course, we know that God's word is indeed true. Uh, we have the historical evidence, we have the supernatural testimony of Jesus Christ, who claimed to be the divine Son of God and confirmed his claim to his miraculous, sinless life, death, and resurrection. So he confirmed his claim to be the Son of God and what he taught was indeed true. He gave us a window, right, on the Olivet Discourse into what we can expect at the end of the age. And he inspired his apostles to also give us a brief uh, window into what is to come regarding the end of the age there. Now, the corona crisis, is there a connection with biblical prophecy here? Well, first, let me give you a big picture of Bible prophecy here, right? <clears throat> At the end here in the blue there, we are right now in what is called the church age, Revelation 1 through 3. We are presently now in the church age where God has commissioned the church, Christians, okay, to bring the gospel to the entire world. But the church age is going to come to an end there in an event that Andy referred to earlier called the rapture, right? First Thessalonians chapter four, it talks about that we'll be suddenly taken out of the world okay, at the last trumpet call of God the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who remain shall be caught up. Okay? <laughs> the Greek word there is harpazo. Okay? It means a sudden snatching away, a violent sudden snatching away. The Latin is rapturus, and so that's where the word rapture comes from. When the church 
is suddenly taken out of the world. First Corinthians 15 says it's gonna happen as fast as a blink of an eye, that quick, and we are going to be transformed. The dead in Christ shall rise first. That means those Christians who have died and gone before us, their bodies shall be resurrected. They'll receive their glorious resurrection body. Then we who remain shall be caught up in the air that we will be transformed uh, with our eternal glorious heavenly bodies as well. And we'll be taken out of the world. Now, after the rapture comes the battle of Gog and Magog talked about in Ezekiel 38 and 39, which Andy will talk about in the coming Middle East war there. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but after that period, then will come what we see in the red here. And this is what I wanna emphasize here, the seven year tribulation, when God's judgment is poured out upon the earth here, right? And that's where we're gonna be spending a lot of our time at this conference here. Now, between the rapture, and the beginning of the tribulation, right? There's a gap there in time, perhaps a few weeks, perhaps a few months, all right? That's when that great battle of Gog and Magog is gonna happen that Andy's gonna talk to you about. But what begins the tribulation is the signing of the peace covenant between the Antichrist and Israel. And that begins the seven year tribulation. That's when you know you are uh, gonna see some of the most uh, cataclysmic disasters that fall upon the earth. Where will the church be at that time? Will we be in heaven and we face what's called the Bema seat judgment, all right? That's where we're judged upon our works, how we stewarded our life and resources here upon the earth. And this is not a judgment of salvation. We're already there. It's a judgment of rewards and we'll be receiving our rewards at that time. If you want more on the Bema seat judgment, uh, you can listen to more uh, on our website, evidenceandanswers.org there. Now, after the seven-year tribulation, this is when the Antichrist appears. That, you know, person that Andy was talking about. We have the one world government, one world economy. Uh, we have uh, catastrophes like you've never seen before. Uh, demonic forces coming out of the abyss. Uh, the seas turning to blood, the moon turning to blood, stars falling from the sky. Uh, nearly two thirds, I believe, of the world's population is killed in these great catastrophes there. And at the end of the seven year tribulation, then Christ will return with the heavenly host here. Satan will be locked up here in the bottomless pit, the abyss for a thousand years. And Christ will rule and reign for a thousand years, establishing his kingdom, fulfilling those prophecies, sitting on David's throne, ruling from David's throne in the city of Jerusalem. Then after a thousand years, Satan will be let loose one last time to deceive mankind. There'll be the final battle as they siege the city of Jerusalem. Christ returns and destroys evil, defeats evil once and for all. Uh, Satan, is, th is thrown into the lake of fire. The unbelieving world will stand before the great white throne judgment. And there they go into the lake of fire. That's their final resting place for all, all eternity. Then we have a new heaven and a new earth. Second Peter three says the old earth as is destroyed by fire. We have a new heaven and new earth and down comes the heavenly city of Jerusalem and we go into eternity. All right, so briefly, that is the timeline here, the end times timeline here that we'll be referring to here throughout our session here, okay? Now, uh, the part we're focusing on right here is that seven year tribulation period here. Uh, that's what many people have questions about right now regarding the COVID-19 crisis. Now the Bible teaches that in the end times, there'll be plagues and pandemics on an unprecedented scale that ravage the earth. When Jesus was preaching on the Olivet Discourse, as he is sitting with his disciples on the Mount of Olives there, looking down on Mount Zion there, looking down on the temple of Jerusalem, they ask him, 
When will these things happen? What will be the signs of your return? And Jesus goes into what we call the Olivet Discourse. And he states there, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places, famines and pestilences. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. So one of the things that will occur before Christ returns is natural catastrophes like earthquakes, famines, and pandemics, or pestilence, or plagues, okay? Now, remember, when we talk about signs of Christ's return, and when Christ said, look for these signs of my return, he's referring to his return, not the rapture, all right? If you remember the rapture here, when the church is suddenly taken out of the earth, taken from the earth, uh, there are no signs regarding the rapture. It could happen at any minute. All right, but when Christ says, look for the signs of my return, he's talking about this part here. When he returns uh, to defeat Satan and the forces of evil and establish his millennial kingdom, all right? <clears throat> now, this particular prophecy that Jesus makes here refers to the tribulation period here, all right? This red area, the tribulation period. Remember, we're in the church age right now. So this is a future prophecy, eh? the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. This is in regards to the tribulation period. So Jesus' prophecy here in Luke 21, Matthew 24, Mark 13 has not happened yet. All right. This is what you see in the COVID-19 pandemic is not the fulfillment of Jesus' prophetic words here yet. It's going to be even worse. Then in Revelation chapter 6, the Apostle John writes about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, this frightening um, vision that he gets regarding the coming apocalypse here and the four horsemen here. And the first rider rides on a white horse carrying a bow with no arrow. And this represents a future ruler, the false Christ. Okay? He masquerades as Christ, I believe the Antichrist here. Okay? And he has a bow with no arrows. In other words, he comes in peace, a false peace. All right? He's going to establish his rule over the earth, rather peacefully. All right? Apparently, he's going to be a very charismatic, very powerful, persuasive kind of speaker. Now, the second horse that John sees is the red horse, and he takes peace from the earth. He's carrying a sword, right? And he represents wars that will break out during the tribulation period. The third horse is a black horse representing famine, and that, of course, often follows wars, right? We have a great famine as lands and countries are decimated all over the world. And then the fourth horse, he says, is a pale horse representing death. And he said Hades was riding right behind him. And in Revelation 6, verse 8, it says, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth there. And so in these two passages and several others, it states that pestilence will kill a massive population of the earth in the end times. Now, as I stated earlier, these passages are fulfilled in the tribulation period, all right? So it's still future. And hopefully we are correct that the rapture will occur before the tribulation begins. Okay. I think the evidence is quite compelling that the rapture occurs before the tribulation. And I hope we are correct. And if that indeed is correct, we won't be here to suffer these great catastrophes that come upon the earth during those seven years. We will not be around. <clears throat> but these passages okay, are fulfilled during the time of the tribulation. So COVID-19 pandemic is not the fulfillment of these passages 
nor is it any kind of indication that we are now in the tribulation period or in the end times. These prophecies are still in the future. Now, <clears throat> but I believe COVID-19 illustrates really how realistic these biblical prophecies are. Okay. So though COVID-19 is not uh, God's judgment on the tribulation period yet, it's certainly a wake-up call to us to indeed reflect upon our lives and to reflect upon our relationship with God, to repent and get right with God. But I believe the COVID-19 crisis also illustrates how realistic biblical prophecy is. I mean, we saw with COVID-19 just how quickly this virus can spread throughout the earth and kill uh, hundreds of people just within days. You know, even with our great technological advances, we remain helpless against such a threat. <clears throat> and the fallout from this pandemic reflects in a small way the future fallout that's going to occur in the end times. I think we saw in this, you know, with the spread of the virus here, there was a huge economic fallout threatening, you know, to shut down financial markets around the world, sending people into all kinds of economic uh, <clears throat> and emotional kinds of panic here. Imagine during the time of the tribulation, a worse pandemic and plagues shall arise that last for longer periods, right? And if COVID-19 caused this kind of havoc, imagine what more severe plagues and pandemics during the tribulation period is gonna cause. Uh, it's gonna cause a massive economic collapse here, a devaluing, devaluing of currency, and we're gonna see a need for all the nations to work together under some kind of central leadership here, a one world government here described in Revelation chapter 13, a one world economy, a one world government led by a charismatic leader, the Antichrist. And we could see here, you know, especially for us here in Hawaii, you know, they were threatening to shut down ports. They were threatening to shut down trains. How, you know, if our ports are closed, we cannot receive goods uh, and supplies, can easily lead to famine and food shortages, sending the cost, you know, of a loaf of bread skyrocketing. You know, not only the cost of a loaf of bread, we saw what it did to the price of toilet paper, right? I mean, toilet paper was going through the roof and people were going crazy, you know, trying to find toilet paper around here, right? Imagine when you have a pandemic on a much huger scale, the kind of havoc it's going to wreak upon the earth where the price of food and other needed supplies are just gonna skyrocket as uh, transportation uh, and means of getting supplies around the world are gonna be tremendously affected and shut down. And you can see how COVID-19 is driving us towards globalism, how the world needed to come together and work together in an orderly way. And it's, you can see Revelation 13 talks about a one world kind of economic system, a one world government ruled by the Antichrist. And we saw in COVID-19, right? Nations having to work together to defeat this pandemic. And, you know, we're seeing that there needs to be some kind of world organization to lead this effort to defeat COVID-19 on a global scale. Well, imagine when you see in the book of Revelation, you know, a third of the oceans turning to blood, the rivers turning to blood, uh, the stars falling from the sky, poisoning the waters of the earth. Uh, fire coming down from heaven, destroying, you know, nearly a quarter of the earth. I mean, imagine how the world is going to have to come together, right, to address the economic and uh, 
the turmoil that will be going on at that time. And you also see the push to, to this one world economy, economies around the world in free fall. And imagine, you know, when you have a plague that's worse than COVID-19. COVID-19, you know, uh, we saw economies around the world shutting down as businesses had to shut down. And, and then how, what do we do to these people who are now out of work without income? Well, economies were shutting down, right? People uh, and the governments uh, to support their economies were just printing money, right? With really no value behind them. And you end up with a valueless kind of currency that we saw in Germany, you know, during uh, just before World War II, where a cup of coffee there was <laughs> nearly $4,000. You know, um, and, and so there's just a devaluing of currency here. And you can see there's a push, a need for a cashless currency controlled by, you know, a one world kind of economy controlled by a central leadership here. You know, you see that needs, you know, beginning to arise here. And, and imagine, you know, when you have a a pandemic that's worse than COVID-19, that lasts longer. Uh, you can see a push uh, towards this area here. Now, so I believe that we're seeing a preview, all right, of what's going to be coming during the time of the tribulation. We're seeing just in a small scale what the judgments God ha has stored uh, for those who do not receive him as Lord and Savior and will be will not be included in the rapture and be ending up going through the tribulation period. Now, what we see going on around us, you know, plagues and pandemics uh, are previews of what is to come. I believe it is setting the stage setting the stage for the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. You know, COVID-19 and other disasters, they're just a part of the indicators that will intensify as we draw near to the return of Christ. You know, <clears throat> uh, Mark Hitchcock, you know, in his book, talks about the beautiful drive he has from Oklahoma to uh, Dallas, Texas, you know, a three hour drive he has from Oklahoma to Texas to teach there from his church to teach at Dallas Theological Seminary. And uh, not sure what he's talking about there. I've been on that drive. Ain't that great, man? You know, I mean, Mark, you want a real drive. You want the Pacific Coast Highway. And so, you know, when I get a chance, uh, I make that drive from Northern California down to Los Angeles, you know, Southern California on the Pacific Coast Highway. It goes right along the Pacific Cliffs. Just beautiful, gorgeous, beautiful kind of drive there. And, you know, <clears throat> as I get closer to the city of Los Angeles, I see more and more billboard signs showing that I am getting closer. There are more signs telling me I'm getting closer to the city of Los Angeles. So when you see more and more signs like this going on, and uh, it's beginning to intensify, you know that you're getting close to the return of Christ. So I think COVID-19, although it's not the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, certainly sets the stage and gives us a preview as to what is coming during the time of the Great Tribulation. Now, what's the verdict on COVID-19 then? If we're not in the end times, and indeed it is not the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Well, one of the questions I get asked is, is COVID-19 God's judgment upon the earth? Well, in the Bible, God used plagues uh, and pandemics as a form of judgment. We see in Exodus chapter nine, he used the plagues to judge the nation of Israel. In 1 Samuel chapter five, he used the plague of tumors to judge the Philistines when they took the Ark of the Covenant for themselves there after the battle against Israel. In 2 Samuel 24, we see that God used plagues to 
judge the nation of Israel, specifically King David, for his sinful census that he took there. And in the Old Testament law, in books like Deuteronomy chapter 28 and 29, Isaiah 51 and Jeremiah 24, God warned the people of Israel that calamities such as pestilence and plagues would come upon them if they turned away from him and followed the evil ways of the pagan nations. Right? So God did use plagues and pandemics as a form of judgment to discipline Israel, to get her to repent and turn back to God, not only Israel, but other nations as well. Now, not every natural disaster is necessarily God's judgment. Some are the results of living in a fallen world. You know, and there are many uh, preachers, unfortunately, that declare the judgment of God almost at every natural disaster that occurs or preachers, you know, that the end is coming. We are in the end times whenever some kind of earthquake or catastrophe occurs. But there's a basic principle here that we follow, that we need to be silent when the Bible is silent, and we need to speak when the Bible speaks. So when it comes to COVID-19, God is silent here. Now, God uses tragedies to get our attention and to teach us valuable lessons that we need to respond to. Tragedies like COVID-19 and others provide an opportunity for us to reflect upon our life and our relationship with God. And so God often uses natural disasters to teach us some valuable lessons. Well, what are some valuable lessons that God could be teaching us through this time? Well, it's probably a couple dozen, but uh, let me just take time for just a few lessons that I believe God is teaching us at this time. Number one, <laughs> tragedy or natural disasters teach us some valuable lessons. Number one, it exposes error. Two in particular, the area of false hope and the area of false teachings. You know, when it comes to false hope, you know, there's often the belief in our modern culture today that we can accomplish anything without God. We don't need God. We can, you know, through science, we can cure all disease, we can conquer all sicknesses, and uh, we can defeat aging and bring ourselves eternal life. You know, something that I've been studying called techno faith, the faith in science and technology, that through science and technology, we are going to uh, defeat aging. We're going to find the aging gene and shut it down and we're going to have eternal life. Okay? And through artificial intelligence and biotechnology, we're going to have uh, superhuman intelligence, you know, Google-like intelligence and superhuman-like angelic powers. You know, so uh, this is called, you know, part of the transhumanist movement, right? Where it's a mix of uh, technology and human nature to create the cyborg, the next evolution or step in human evolution here. And uh, through in inserting artificial intelligence in our brains, through exoskeletons and other biotechnology, we're going to have Google-like intelligence, angelic powers. Through genetic engineering, we're going to solve the aging issue and have eternal life, right? And we're uh, going to create this uh, utopia, without God, man will conquer all. Well, that's a false hope. Right? We're learning that this tiny little virus, right, where we seem to be helpless against this kind of uh, pandemic that strikes. And imagine, you know, when worse ones come upon us. So it uh, exposes the error of false hope. We still need God and we need a savior, we need Jesus Christ. And it also exposes false teachings, all right? There are many out there claiming to be the incarnation of God or the Messiah, right? 
or some great healer. Uh, this, of course, is Kibaloi there in the Philippines. He claims to be the Son of God and the new owner of the world. Okay, God incarnate. And, but, you know, these people claiming supernatural, miraculous powers uh, to heal. Well, where are they now? I mean, if we ever needed them to be cleaning out the hospitals and uh, defeating COVID-19, boy, we really need them now. Where are they? They're strangely silent all of a sudden. Huh? So I think it exposes false teachings and false teachers. Next, another lesson is that times like these, they expose sin, specifically the sin of pride, uh, human pride that says, we can do it all and we can do it and we don't need God. You know, times like this really exposes our pride and, and humbles us, exposes the sin of idolatry. Whenever you place your faith and hope in something else other than God, that is idolatry. And for too long now, we have placed our faith in our abilities, in science, in technology, uh, in uh, money. Uh, we have placed our security in, in our material wealth and finances. And running into a pandemic like this shows us we can't place our faith in the material things of this world. We need to place it in a, on a foundation that can never be destroyed, never be taken away, and will never come to an end. And that's only found in God, a relationship with God, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it exposes sin. Next, I believe times like these corrects our thinking. It reminds us that we are not in control of all things. There is a God, and He is in control of all things. As great as human achievements have been, ultimately, the world and the universe lies under the sovereign control and direction of the Almighty God Himself. Second, it reminds us what is really important. You know, when the pandemic first hit, we suddenly realized what was really important. It's not our stock portfolios. It's not necessarily uh, our looks. Okay? <clears throat> it's not necessarily the material things around us that are important. We discovered what was really important. We were reminded what's really important. And those are the things that matter that will last for all eternity, which is God, the Word of God, and the souls of men and women. And we are reminded what's really most important. It's God and those that we love. And we need to invest our time in those things that matter for eternity. Third, it reminded us to appreciate all that we have. The Bible teaches us to give thanks to God in all circumstances and in all things to give thanks. You know, to thank God for what we have, our health, our family, and the opportunity for eternal life and a relationship with God and to value His Word. And many people are beginning to really appreciate now the fellowship of the body of Christ. Many of us are restricted from gathering in large groups to fellowship and worship together. And we long for that day when we can come back together as a big fellowship and body of Christ and to worship together and study God's word. And uh, we're reminded, you know, to appreciate that ability, you know, to worship together every Sunday that many of us were taken for granted for a long time. Then it reminds us to examine ourselves, to see if there's any sin in our lives that we are tolerating, to repent and turn and get right in our relationship with God. And so tragedies like this teach us a lot of valuable lessons. And now that many of us are in some kind of lockdown, 
it provides us the time to really reflect upon our lives, to examine our lives and uh, get things right with God and to soak in, you know, kind of lessons that God wants to teach us now. So there are some very valuable lessons we need to learn. And how do we respond then in this time of crisis? Well, oh, and the final lesson to be learned, I believe, during times like this, it, it builds character. As we humble ourselves, uh, remove sin from our lives, repent and turn to God in full dependence upon Him, remembering that we are completely dependent upon Him. He is in charge of all things. You know, it builds within us character needed for us to become more and more like Jesus Christ. So if we learn these valuable lessons well, I think we'll come out of this eventually uh, a more holy, a more righteous and a stronger people ready to live for Christ in a greater way if we learn the valuable lessons that God has for us during this time. Well, what is the rightful response then for us during this time? I believe here are several. First, we need to humble ourselves and get right with God. COVID-19 is not necessarily the judgment of God, but it's definitely a wake-up call from God. Times like this, God can use to stir within us and wake us up and really examine our lives and and help us, remind us that we need to turn from sin and get right with Him. So the rightful response is, is to humble ourselves before the Lord, knowing that He is God and we're, we're not, and that our lives are really dependent upon Him, and He is the true Lord of all creation. Second, we need to reflect and examine our lives. You know, godly men and women examine their hearts at this time to see if there was any sin that needed to be dealt with and repented of. David wrote in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. He has God to reveal his faults and areas that he needed to deal with and change. And David's response serves as a model for us to take the time now to really examine our lives. Third, I believe God's church, God's people, as a body of Christ, we need to examine ourselves. The church needs to examine herself. As the church, the church must ask, you know, as the body of Christ, are we tolerating sin in our midst? Is there sin that we are tolerating that we must confess and repent of? Have we been faithfully teaching the whole counsel of God's word, calling people to account, pointing out sin, those kind of tough sermons, calling people to repentance from sin, those kind of really tough sermons, calling people to righteousness. Have we been faithfully preaching God's word or simply preaching the kind of things people want to hear to draw the audience uh, into our church? We need to ask, have we been seeking to make disciples, true disciples of Christ? You know, Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you must die to yourself each day. Take up your cross and follow me. Are we truly making disciples or are we simply tickling people's ears with messages that they want to hear? Or are we truly doing the hard work of making disciples for Christ and living as disciples of Jesus Christ. And then as a nation, we need a time of national repentance. You know, many countries involved in the murder of millions of children in things like abortion. Several nations have redefined marriage, the oldest institution in the world created by God, the bedrock of every civilization. Transgenderum today, transgenderism today, defaces the very image of God. And we willfully shake our fists in God's face in defiant rebellion 
expecting that God won't do anything. No, it's time for a national call to repentance and a national turning to God. And so we need to ask ourselves, how are we responding as individuals, as the church of Christ, as a state and as a nation? No, God wrote in 2 Corinthians 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. God's forgiveness and healing of the land only comes when the people of God turn and repent and get right with God. And so we need to keep one eye focused on the present as to what's going on now and one eye focused on the future, right? The Christian needs that balance in their life. If all we look at is that present circumstances, they can get us anxious, even depressed. But when we keep one eye on the present and one eye looking towards the future and how things are unfolding and going right according to God's plan, we can have that kind of joy and hope looking forward to the return of Christ. That's why the study of eschatology is so important. Well, are we in the end times? I don't believe we're in the end times. The events that begin the tribulation period have not occurred. The rapture and the battle of Gog and Magog and the appearance of the Antichrist and the signing of the covenant. However, you know, this pandemic and other natural disasters remind us that we are indeed nearing the return of Christ. When you see an intensifying of events like this, it reminds us the return of Christ is near. So until then, we need to be faithfully living for Christ and looking for his coming. As Andy stated, Titus 2.13, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we await his return, Paul exhorts us to live holy lives and to exercise self-control. We are not called to panic from fear, but instead remain sober and of sound judgment, knowing God is in control and we can trust him even in these uncertain times. Okay? And the term waiting there in Titus, waiting means with hopeful expectation. So let's keep one eye on the present, one eye on the future, watching how things are moving toward, falling into God's plan and moving uh, towards the fulfillment of biblical prophecy and his coming. So although there may be difficult times ahead, we wait with joy and hope because we know Christ is coming. And when he does, it's gonna be a glorious finale to all who have eagerly looked for him. Well, if you enjoyed uh, what you're hearing uh, and you wanna hear it again, well, you can log on on our website at evidenceandanswers.org where we're gonna re-air on the radio and on our website, messages from Andy and myself on this topic and a whole lot more uh, topics regarding the return of Christ. Well, we're gonna take another 10 minute break here. And when we come back, Andy will return with you talking about the exciting things going on in the Middle East now with the Abraham Accords. And is there a connection with what's going on there and the coming Middle East war, all right? So go grab a coffee, go grab lunch. Well, it's a little bit after lunch, but go grab something to eat, relax. We'll see you back here in 10 minutes, okay?